Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you very much for uh, taking the time out of your busy schedules to be here to participate in what is for us a very important uh, item in terms of the uh, finances of the Hamilton Police Service and the ability of the service to provide public safety. And I want to go through a few introductions uh, this evening so that everyone uh, knows who is here. Uh, first of all, the members of our police service board that are present have the responsibility of adjudicating the budget submission and uh, approving or rejecting that budget. If it's approved, it moves on to city council and then city council goes through the, the same process of review and approve uh, according to the legislation in those areas. So from the police services board, we have the chair of the police services board here, Nancy DiGregorio. We also have the vice chair here, Mr. Jim Kay, and board members present. Uh, we have Madeline Levy and Irene Station. And Councillor Whitehead, as our city councillor, uh, sits as a rep representative of council on the police services board. And also uh, present from council, uh, we have Brenda Johnson here. And uh, Brenda and I have uh, had the pleasure of being out here uh, a few times for community meetings, uh, dealing with issues within the ward. And most recently, we had uh, two forums that took place, one in Winona and one in, uh, in Binbrook. And to help us out with uh, some of our issues today, uh, questions when we get to the comments and questions stage of the, of the proceedings, uh, we have Deputy Chief Lienders here, uh, who looks after our field support services. And the divisional commander for the area is Superintendent Paul Morrison. And Jamie Anderson went over here. Is it, uh, and that uh, Jimmy Anderson is the inspector of the second in charge at the uh, at the division. So first of all, let's uh, let's establish uh, a couple of the uh, of the rules that we have to comply with in this forum. Uh, and the first is that uh, you will be aware in the media over the last uh, week week and a half there have been a report of an internal investigation which has taken place within the Hamilton Police Service which has led to the suspension of a member. Uh, we are prohibited in law from discussing any active ongoing investigation, and I cannot address the specifics of that matter or any other internal investigation. Uh, Section 95 of the Act dictates that those that are responsible for discipline within the police service are not permitted to discuss in a public forum any of the uh, evidence. But what I can tell you is that the Hamilton Police Service is absolutely committed to being a professional organization and where we identify issues of potential misconduct, we will assign our investigators, we will investigate, we will take the appropriate action because we are a professional police organization and we are held to the accountability standards of the Code of Conduct within the Police Services Act and we accept that as police officers. The other uh, issue that is important is that uh, if there is any one tonight that needs to, to speak to a specific case that may be a, a citizen's complaint, it may be a complaint about service, uh, the superintendent from the local division is here, Paul Morrison, and we, and we will take that issue uh, directly to him following the meeting. And where appropriate, if there is a matter that needs to be referred to the Ontario uh, Independent Police Review Commissioner, we will do that as well because we are governed by that legislation. Uh, so with, uh, with that said, uh, we'll get started on, uh, on the presentation. What we're going to do is we're going to take probably about 20 minutes. Uh, we will go through the essence of the issues that confront the police service and we will, uh, and we will provide information to you regarding the scope and the order of magnitude of policing that takes place in our city. And then after that, the most important part of the three town forums is to listen. Uh, and anybody who has either a question, we will answer questions for you where we can, and we will uh, receive your commentary. The board members that have to make the decisions uh, on, on budget and the council members at their stage are here to listen to you and then can take your uh, contributions into consideration as they go about their deliberations. So the Hamilton Police Service uh, budget, 
The increase that is requested for 2013 is $142 million budget, an increase of 5.25 or $7.1 million. That was submitted to the board on, this, on November the 27th, and the board asked us to go back and find efficiencies to find savings uh, to ease that burden within the, uh, within the uh, city, within the municipal tax base. So we then went back and we had a look at our uh, options available to us, and we have now submitted a budget of 4.75%, which is $6.4 million, and that was submitted to our board on December the 17th. What we are required to provide in policing within the Hamilton Police Service is the deployment of officers in what we refer to as the 60-40 model. What we are trying to achieve here is to have 60% of our officers' time on the front line spent in a reactionary mode. That is responding to calls for service. That is all the calls that come from the citizens and being able to deliver our policing services to keep the public safe. The 40% is the time that we are trying to be proactive in the neighborhoods, doing street patrols, being in the surveys, uh, enforcing speeding. When I was here for the town meetings, uh, we heard very clearly from the community, more visibility in the surveys, on patrol, doing uh, speed enforcement, doing heavy truck enforcement, making sure we had officers available to uh, deal with the ATVs that were running through the fields and destroying crops. And, and we have some exciting, uh, uh, stemming from those community meetings, we have some exciting news that we're going to bring forward uh, in the early part of 2013 with strategies on how we're going to look after some of those issues. But what we want to do is make sure that within our beats, within the patrol areas, the officers have about 60% of their time spent reactionary and about 40% of their time in a proactive manner to look after all of the issues around our schools, around your neighborhoods, stop signs, all of the things, all the enforcement things that we want in our quality of life. With respect to our analysis, the, the Hamilton Police Service completed a seven-year strategic staffing plan, and the analysis there indicates that in order for us to achieve the 60-40 deployment model, to be able to provide that service and do all the work that we require, we need 61 people to join the organization. That is 45 officers and 16 civilians. So we recognize that staffing is but one component of what we are trying to achieve in delivering public safety. Uh, we are also looking at our business processes, our technology, and our options that are available to us so that we do not have to continue to throw resources into this. People is not the only solution. And what we have done is we've created a case preparation unit. The case prep unit, the theory behind this is what we do is we have centralized a group of people and they can look after all of the administrative functions that flow from the preparation of crown packages when we arrest people and prepare packages that go to the courts from the police service. And that happens around 7,000 times per year. When we started this, our baseline average in preparing a uh, crown package was four hours and 17 minutes by each officer sitting at the computer doing their administrative work. When we put this process in place, and it's been up and running about a year, year and a half now, uh, we have seen a reduction in the time that is required per crown package to be reduced to about an hour and four minutes. We have recovered about three hours of officers' administrative time and during that time now, they are available to go back out onto the road and respond to calls for service. So they now take their notes, they do uh, tombstone information into the system, forward it to the centralized case prep unit, they do all the work, and then it progresses through the supervisory approval process and makes its way over to courts. One of the things we've also done is we've actually taken people who are the end product users from courts, we've moved them to case preparation unit, so what the product is they need at the far end, we actually have them now helping us create it at, at the beginning. So our quality assurance issues are much improved as well. Uh, we are embarking on the enterprise, enterprise resource management project. What we are doing here is, is trying to put in place a fully integrated human resource information system, which will allow us to move to the next step, which is electronic scheduling of officers. 
and having a time and resource management system in place, which then will give us, as, uh, as managers of the service, the ability to produce management level reports to actually analyze at a greater level the time that our officers are spending on different job functions. Uh, that is combined with the crime analysis process, which we are trying to enhance as well. And it is very important to recognize that we need to get multiple levels of information into the hands of all of our members. At a command level, I need to see crime that is dispersed, what, what type of crime, where it's happening, time of day, but I need to see it at the city level so we can talk about the deployment of personnel across the city. A divisional commander needs to see it at the divisional level so we can consider the appropriate deployment, special projects, things that need to happen in different areas to uh, enhance public safety needs to see it at a divisional level, and our officers actually need to see it at the beat level in their car doing the work that they provide every single day. So an officer's on uh, their days off for two or three days, when they come back, they should be able to get into their cruiser, access the crime analysis programs, select, I want to see all the break and enters that occurred in my patrol area over the last 72 hours, and they should get it. And they should be able to query those things and make those queries of the system in a manner which reflects what they're working because crime patterns are different on day shift than they are on night shift. They're different in the afternoon than they are in the middle of the night. Our people need to know that. Supervisors need to know that because we're not going to deploy people driving around looking for bad people. It doesn't work. It's very expensive and it's not productive. We need to be specifically uh, analyzing the crimes to be in the area at the time to be most effective to make those arrests and apprehensions that we need to make. We're also looking at uh, shift schedule alterations and just passed on January the 6th. We did put in place uh, new shift hours. We have actually moved some of our complement of officers to higher priority uh, times during the day when calls are increasing. We now have, instead of a flatline deployment, uh, our officers working 12 hours, and the shift works days, and the shift works nights. Well, now we've shuffled officers. We now have officers starting later in the day. We have night shift officers coming back and starting earlier in the afternoon. As the calls for service rise at about 9, 10 o'clock in the morning, and they start to build, complete, and, and continue right through till about midnight, 1 o'clock in the morning, uh, we have trouble keeping up with that demand for service and that impacts response times. What we're doing now is we're matching the deployment to the demand and we're hoping that that will have a significant impact on reducing our response time issues. We're also looking at court staffing and Deputy Leendertz has led a project for the last number of months and has actually found uh, savings in the handling of prisoners within the court system at the rate of about 500 hours per month. So we're always looking for those efficiencies. We're very proud of our relationships and our partnerships in the community on, on many levels. One of those is our partnership with St. Joe's. What we're doing with St. Joe's is we have now reached a protocol in place where we transfer responsibility from the police service to the hospital with respect to those people that we apprehend under the Mental Health Act. What we were actually seeing in our history was we would apprehend someone under the Mental Health Act, take them to hospital, we'd have to be cleared through the emergency, through the medical process, and then we'd be filtered over to psych, and then psych would do their work. We'd be there for two, three, four hours. Uh, sometimes you would drive by the, by the hospital, you'll see three, four, five patrol cars out there. That's what's going on. Um, the emergence of mental health issues in our community is very significant, and we have here in Hamilton a phenomenal, uh, planned, well thought out response to, to these situations of mental illness and emotional crisis. Uh, we're very proud of our relationship with St. Joe's. We're very proud of our program, the Coast Program, uh, and the Coast Program does a great job working right across the entire city with, with all, all individuals that need their help. St. Joe's protocol now is our target time is 60 minutes. We're into the hospital. If we can transfer responsibility, we fill out the risk assessment sheet and sign it. They sign it, accept responsibility. We remove police officers. We put security guards there, and then the, the police officers go back out onto the road. So right now, we've reduced our time. We're at about 80, 81 minutes right now. The goal is 60 minutes, but there have been nights 
when there is just so much going on in the emergency rooms that our times do escalate, that's a, that's a resource problem right across the board. But we're continuing to look for these efficiencies. And the Social Navigator program is having a, a social navigator, uh, a person who is trained, master's prepared person in social work. It happens to be a paramedic at this point. It's a program funded by the city on contract to the Hamilton Police Service. This is social, uh, social supports that wrap around our action strategy team. Our action officers, what started this was, we were dealing with issues predominantly in the downtown core. Although we have analyzed the, the top 13 categories of violent crime right across the entire city, uh, we have identified areas and neighborhoods where we need to be more present and visible and doing the work because of the crime and the nature of crime. But what we have done is we have also analyzed the number of people that we as a police service come into contact with every two days, every three days, every four days, and they, they interact with us. So they are in fact consuming the services of the Hamilton Police. So initially we also thought, well, if they're consuming our services, they must be consuming the services of the paramedics. So we met with our paramedic partners. How often are you seeing this individual? Every three days, every four days, every five days. Well, if we're seeing them that often, and you're seeing them that often, let's go talk to the hospital. How often are you seeing them? Every three days, every four days, every five days. So the issue then is, why are we all providing this level of service? Why don't we get our agencies together that provide social supports to these folks that need it, that present with certain vulnerabilities, mental health, addictions, drug, alcohol, housing, employment, educational issues, all of those that present as vulnerabilities and challenges to people, we can look after that in a better way. What we do now is we meet every Tuesday and Thursday for about an hour, hour, hour and a half with all the social agencies. We identify individuals who need some assistance and we get them into the proper care. We can, in fact, uh, arrest a whole bunch of people every day. We can put them in the cells, we can lock the cells, and we can go away happy at night. We're quite happy to do that. It's the wrong thing to do. So we have to find a better way because once people enter the judicial system, it's very expensive to proceed through that and particularly individuals that suffer those uh, vulnerabilities, they don't belong in the criminal justice system. So we've got to find a better way. And one of the reasons that we did this was our local LIN reports that 22 individuals are responsible for more than 2,200 visits to our emergency room every single year. That's six a day when they don't need to be there. So we have to stop this. And the social navigator is one of the ways that we're trying to do that. Although we identify in our staffing report the need for 61 new members, 45 officers and 16 civilians, we are asking for 20 officers and one civilian member. The reason that we're doing this is we want to be responsible and prudent in our request because we know that we do need additional personnel. But we also know that we are putting in place new business process systems, case management, uh, uh, the protocols that I just spoke of, we want to allow those the opportunity to flourish and maximize the return on investment to the service, and then we will readjust our analysis to determine what the go-forward strategy has to be to provide public service. So the actual request within this budget at 4.75 is for 21 new personnel. So let's have a look at some of the details and, and the issues that have led us to where we are right now. What we have done is we have completed a 10-year workload analysis, and Debbie Gifford and Rita Lee Irvine are here who have done that work for us over a great number of years. They have put us in a great position through that analysis to make strategic business decisions. The workload analysis is an important part of determining where we've been and where we are, but where we need to go. We've also structured committees that deal with cost containment. How can we uh, save in the providing of services across the board? We have also in 2011 and activated in 2012 taken uh, uh, new revenue generation streams to the board. They have been approved and have been in place in 2012. Uh, we have also completed the seven-year strategic staffing plan, and we have done the business plan member survey. 
There is an awful lot of strategic level work that has been done in order to develop the positions that we, uh, we find ourselves in, and all of that done within the d diminishing provincial and federal funding. In 2010, we went through a restructuring and realignment. We created and enhanced the professional standards branch. We put in place a risk manager. We have done a, an awful lot of work on preventative uh, cause and effect issues to hopefully save money down the road. Uh, the things that we have done paying off in reductions in departmental collisions, redu reductions in civil actions. But what the work that we have already done in the last few years produced last year is they produced the lowest budget request of the Hamilton Police Service through our board to City Council that we have seen in the last 10 years. We have demonstrated fiscal accountability and responsibility through our business processes and we received the, uh, the support of the board and the city last year with the lowest budget submission in 10 years. What are we required to provide in law? And the Police Services Act governs exactly what the services are that must be provided. We must provide crime prevention, law enforcement, assistance to victims of crime, public order maintenance, and emergency response. And that is what must be provided by the Hamilton Police Service in law. The board must have a budget in support of providing those services. And it's the city's responsibility to provide all of the necessary infrastructure and administration in support of the Police Services Act requirements. And your uh, Hamilton Police Service uh, are continuing to drive advances in policing. And let's see where we have gone over a period of years and what we are producing. We don't produce widgets and things at the end of the day. What we produce is public safety. And this is very encouraging. The concept of community-based policing put into policing 25, 30 years ago. Uh, historically, we used to police the community. Now we police with the community. We have strong partnerships. We look for alternative ways to deal with issues that confront all of our neighborhoods. And we are seeing a general, very positive trend downwards in the rate of crime that is taking place from the levels where it was in 2002. I draw your attention to the yellow line on the bottom, which is the uh, violent crime. And what that, what that shows is violent crime has been relatively stable over the same period of years. And uh, that actually means that in our city, there are between six and 7,000 people each year that are victims of a violent crime. So we have an awful lot of work that needs to be done. The Ontario Municipal Board uh, receives data from all of the cities that, that report there. There's primarily 14 cities uh, that are analyzed, and you can see that Hamilton there on the left-hand side, in fact, uh, Hamilton with respect to violent crime, of the, I believe, 14 reporting agencies, we generally have the third highest rate of violent crime and, and in 2011, we were, the, we were second highest for the violent rate, of, the rate of violent crime taking place in a city. So when you think that Hamilton has a higher rate of violent crime, and you go across the names, uh, Ottawa, Sudbury, Toronto, that's fairly significant. We've got a lot of work to do. This is very important because this deals with the severity or the seriousness of crime. The severity or the seriousness of crime of crime is what takes place on our streets, is arrested by the service, cases prepared that go before the court, and then the court registers convictions for violent crimes. And they're given a weighted average. And when you compare cities to cities, jurisdictions to jurisdictions, you'll get a picture of, of, of the seriousness of crime. But here, 2004 to 2007, a lot of violent crime was taking place on our streets. What was taking place was there was, a, there was a significant number of shootings that took place. I believe the number we looked at was about 56 shootings took place that year. We had gang activity, we had a lot of drug activity. What the service response was, was we enhanced the long, the long established uh, COP 2000 program uh, with, uh, with where we were working with our neighborhood officers uh, and our core patrol. We created a gangs and weapons unit. 
We shut down a homicide investigation team and changed them into a shooting investigations team. We did an awful lot of work, and at that time as well, and I'll show you the slide in, in a moment dealing with staff. At that time as well, there were 22 officers that were hired into the Hamilton Police Service, put in place in 2007, and all of those programs combined. You can see that the three-year increase, 2004 to 2007, in violent crime, seriousness of crime, immediately started to go down and has been on a decrease ever since by the continuation of the programs that were put in place. Our calls for service over the last five years have remained relatively stable. There's about 75 to 80,000 calls for service every year. That's citizens calling in that details, events are created that our officers then respond to. So they have remained relatively stable over the last five years. The prioritization, prioritization of calls, priority zero calls are calls that involve the risk of imminent bodily harm or death. These are the calls that we have got to get to immediately. And as you can see, those numbers actually are quite low. The distribution of the other priorities remain relatively stable. And as the priority decreases, so priority four, there are different response time standards, there are different response mechanisms available to us, but we, we have to do all the calls, it's just how they get done. But they have remained relatively stable, and the work that was done by this service uh, 10, 15 years ago in relation to beats, beat assignments, beat distribution, geographical area, time on calls, response times, all of that work done, done 10, 15 years ago is still very valid work today because we continue to check and assess. So what has changed? The calls for service are relatively stable at 75 to 80,000. The distribution of calls within their priorities are relatively stable. But what has changed is what happens within policing and some of it is not within the control of the Hamilton Police Service. Let me give you an example. What this shows you is that the time required to complete those calls has risen by about 35, 36,000 hours. That's the equivalent of about 22 to 24 officers. The Supreme Court of Canada makes a decision in law. It's referred to as the Feeney decision. What the Feeney decision was, it says to police officers, if you have the authority to arrest a person and they're in their house, you have to get a warrant to get in that house. Even though you have the authority to arrest the person, they are still in their castle. So how does that play out? That's a decision of the Supreme Court of Canada. Must, are we obliged to follow that? Yes, we are. And we will. But what does that look like in day-to-day -day policing? What that means is we have the authority to arrest the person that's inside. So we have to call a timeout. We have to surround the house. We have to keep the person contained in the house. We have to send another officer to the station to do an information to obtain a warrant, a Feeney endorsed warrant, so that we can actually get in the house. We fax that to an on-call justice of the peace. We hope that they're available, then they read it, then they get back to us and fax it back. And if they approve the warrant, then we take it to the scene, we let everybody know we've got the warrant, and then the same arrest authority that we had, we can now execute with the Feeney warrant. And all of that takes hours upon hours upon hours to do. That's nothing to do with the Hamilton Police Service, but it is a requirement in law, and we have to do it. Disclosure is another critical issue. The fair trial rights of individuals. We are required to provide disclosure. When I was a young police officer, a homicide case would fit into two banker's boxes and you'd carry them to court, that's it. Now we need a small truck to deliver disclosure over to the courthouse. We're doing it electronically, so now we do hard drives back and forth but there is a ton of information that has to go back and forth. None of that is a speedy process. So how are we doing in our action areas? Uh, I would draw your attention to the robbery line 2006-2007, where we had over 800 robberies in the action identified target neighborhoods. Uh, we have been able to reduce that in 2011 to uh, under 600. I draw your attention also on the bottom right to the uh, parades, festivals, and protests. What we do now is we are seeing in our city increased levels of civil disobedience, increased levels of protest, and it is a requirement in law. It is a component of the, of the charter, of everyone's charter rights. Uh, everyone has the right to have uh, uh, participate in peaceful protest. 
And our job is to facilitate that peaceful protest. So when we get information that these things are happening, we have a full operational plan, we have to plan for different, uh, different opportunities that may present themselves within the demonstration, because we're the ones that have to, to actually police it with the people who are participating in it. But all of that takes time, effort, and money to do, and they're increasing in rate. Uh, if you look at the uh, news tonight, you would, you would have seen that there's now a uh, difference in, in how demonstrations are taking place. Some are pre-planned demonstrations, and now through social media, uh, there's also flash mob demonstrations. And in fact, uh, one of the flash mob uh, demonstrations is, is just coming out on social media within the last hour or so for uh, Cayuga that is going to take place. So people have to be able to respond to that. The police there have to deal with that. That's how things are changing in policing. So with respect to arrests, our arrests are generally about 7,200 to 7,500 a year. And you can see that 2010, 11, and 12, they have increased to 8,800, 8,100, and we're on target in 2012 for 8,600 arrests. So the number of arrests that are being produced by our officers continues to go up. Even though we're doing an awful lot of work in crime prevention, there's an awful lot of work to, to do in response to that violent crime index I showed you earlier. But we're surveying our, our, our citizens about the, their being safe and their feelings of being safe because those are very important, different issues, but very important. And we partnered with Nipissing University and we, continued, uh, we, we uh, completed our own survey. We enjoy an 80% uh, uh, rating, an approval rating of our people. Uh, in the community who feel safe and they and they perceive themselves as being safe. That's important and I'll speak to uh, the issue of why in a few moments. So let's deal with the issue of staffing in the Hamilton Police Service. That is the staffing for our civilian members at the bottom and we cannot succeed as a service without good civilian support and we have excellent members of our civilian staff that help us every day. But you can see that across 12 years it's relatively flat. There's been about 275 civilians in the organization for that number of years. But I would ask you on the administrative work in your own field, what's changed? Technology is changing, paperwork requirements are changing. Are we actually, uh, are we actually saving and having less paper because we're all using computers now? No, that's not happening. There is a ton of administrative work that has to get done, and yet we're doing it through business process re-engineering where we can and using technology. The officers at the top, uh, that's, uh, we have 784 approved officers. We do have overstrength officers uh, that are approved by the board, but that's the staffing that, that generally, it's less than 800 that we deal with in the Hamilton Police Service. I draw your attention to the title at the top. That is grants in. That means the 67 officers that we currently have on grants provided by the federal and the provincial government are included in those numbers. They need a budget line for IT. So if we have a look at the grants out, when we remove the provincial and federal grants, you can see that relatively our staffing has been flat, particularly the last five years. As I mentioned earlier, 2006, 2007, 2007 after the election, there was a, a promise of 100 officers for the Hamilton Police Service. What that actually transpired into in hires was 22 officers. That was at the time as well. Uh, I remind you of the graph on crime severity and the seriousness of crime escalating 2004 to 2007. That was, uh, that was the point where we had some hiring. Other than that, it has been relatively flat. So in Canada, the number of police officers per 100,000, the national average is 201 police officers per 100,000. It, it is a provincial average of 197. And in Hamilton, it is 153. That is, the, that is our, our ratio for what we need to provide service in our community. That's been our ratio that we have established. So what do we actually provide? We do about 13,000 theft incidents and investigations every year. Court administration, about 27, 2,800. But you really need to think that one through. Because what that means is we have arrested somebody, we've put them before the courts. 
The courts have seen fit to release them with conditions. They're living in the community to abide by those conditions. They fail to comply with those conditions, and then we re-arrest them and put them back before the courts. We do that about 27, 2800 times a year. Mischief is the general issues of damage that occur, the quality of life issues. They are criminal offenses, and they need to be reported to us. Impaired driving represents a very, very significant challenge in our city. Last year, 2012, our arrests for impaired driving were higher than 2011. And 2011 was the highest level of impaired driving arrests that the Hamilton Police Service made in the last 15 years. So there's a whole bunch of people out there that are drinking and driving that just don't get it. And it's got to stop. And we are absolutely committed to that level of enforcement. They're driving around out there on the roads that you travel. They're driving around out there on the roads that our officers patrol. So we are going to continue to do our work. And our ride lane enforcement last year was the first year that we, we have gone over 200,000 ride lane stops in a year. The previous uh, year, I think, was 165, 167,000. We had a very significant increase of ride lane checks by our frontline officers. With respect to drugs, if you follow the line across left to right, historically about 1,200, and then 1,400, and then 1,800, and I suspect 2012 is going to be in excess of 2,000 charges related to drugs. Drugs present a very significant issue in our city, and the search, uh, search uh, report, that's substance use related crime in Hamilton, and Inspector Jamie Anderson was one of, the, uh, one of the team members in that report a number of years ago. The number of people that are arrested for financial institution robberies, robberies on the street, convenience store robberies, all crimes associated to the quick grab for cash or the quick grab for property that can easily be converted into cash and then into drugs is very profound. And the rates are astonishing. I think it's 65, 70, 75 percent of people that are arrested for those types of robberies have previous drug convictions. So we have to pay attention to the drug issue. Fraud is a particular challenge in, uh, in, in the city. And what we're seeing in the way that fraud is being uh, carried out is it is changing. Technology is changing the face of crime, and fraud is changing as a crime. Uh, one of the things that is presenting itself now is the abuse of our senior citizens. And one of the most powerful, uh, one of the most prolific incidents of fraud is being uh, committed now in the abuse of power of attorney. That means that people who have been selected by that individual to be their guardian are in fact the ones that are defrauding them. Those are very lengthy investigations, uh, a lot of paperwork, a lot of effort, but we're trying to protect people's life savings, and it's got to be done. Child pornography. When you look at the numbers, you look at that and you think, well, that's not too bad. That's fairly low. That's terrible because the amount of victimization that takes place in child pornography cases is huge. And we're committed to work on this. The average case, when we make computer seizures, when you deal with uh, uh, cataloging images and reviewing the evidence, the average case now is holding about a million images of pornographic material. One of the last cases we did, four terabytes of data was seized with over 1,200 child pornography videos. And our officers have to sit and go through every single one. We have to try and identify who the victim is. We have to determine if they're still being trafficked in, in, in pornography. We have to find out where they are and account for them. And we've got to do those things, and then we've got to be able to present it all to the court. Those take a ton of time. Death investigations, we do about 700 death investigations in the city a year. We have the same response all the time. We need to investigate until the Hamilton Police Service can determine that the person's death is not as a result of criminality. And then we can step away from it and the normal process can take place. But we cannot do that in law, and we cannot do that in concert with the Coroner's Act until we've made that determination. So this is a, this, a lot of time is spent in this area. And suicide is very, very important for us to talk about and for us to focus on. It's important for our schools, it's important for Coast, it's important for the Hamilton Police Service. 
We have provided our dispatchers and our call takers with safe talk, safe talk training. We have given them crisis intervention training. We have provided officers to the Coast team and we work with them. This is an issue we have to pay attention to. In 2009, the 58 suicides that took place there, the youngest person in our city to commit suicide that year was 12 years old. What could possibly have gone wrong in your life by the time you were 12? We need to have the processes in place to find these and intervene. And we're absolutely committed to our programs to do this. I've addressed the issue earlier of uh, mental illness and emotional crisis. But you can see the amount of apprehensions and how they're increasing. We're building a larger facility on, on West Pitt. I don't know what the impact of that is going to be. I would suggest that it's going to present challenges to us in the terms of policing. The numbers are increasing, but we're looking for alternative strategies to deal with that, as I mentioned through the protocol. But we are, in fact, in law, the only people who have the ability to apprehend, and we have to do it. Missing persons. As you can see, earlier in 2006, almost 3,000 people going missing in our city. Every single person is an important person. Every single person deserves and gets the same police response. We show up, we take the report, we interview people, we conduct a search, we fill out the search urgency chart, we get a search manager, we assign investigators, and we look. Because everyone's important, and we have to find them. And sometimes we find them in 10 minutes, sometimes in 10 hours, sometimes in 10 days. But the fact of the matter is sometimes we don't find them. But every single person deserves that response. If you look at the most recent report that has come from British Columbia, Justice Opal's report, every single person deserves the same response. And they've said it in the report around the issue of uh, missing and murdered Aboriginal women in that community. We need to learn. Because what Justice Opal writes in his report about the Campbell Report, he refers to the Campbell Report as lessons not learned. We told you to do these things, but they're not getting done. And now Justice Opal's telling us to do them again. My question is, how many more people need to tell us what to do and how to do it before we actually do it? And we have to provide this service in our community. Disturbances occur at the rate of about 10,000. Our officers are always called out to participate in those and quell and restore public, public order. The 911 calls. People are often under the impression that when they call 911, someone's going to be sitting there waiting for their call to answer their emergency. Well, that happens about 600 times a day in the city of Hamilton. So our dispatchers, our call takers, they're very, very busy people. And we respond to those uh, 600 911 calls a day. The total number of events that we respond to is about 300,000 a year. So this is all the events in, all included. All the calls for service from our citizens, all the proactive events that need to be done by our officers, all the follow-up investigations, all the statements, all the interviews, all the evidence seizures, all the searches, it all needs to be done. And it happens at about 300,000 events per year. But we're also very keen in looking to see where we're able to provide service and where we face challenges. And we monitor when we have no units available. And in each of our divisions, between 20 and 60 times per month, in each of the three divisions, we do in fact have no units available. But you need to know this, the priority zero calls, which are the imminent bodily harm or death calls, we all know as police officers, anything we're doing, we put back into pending, we drop, and we go. We deal with it, and then we pick up where we left off. So on those issues that are public safety, imminent bodily harm, or death situations, you're going to get a response, and you're going to get a, a lot of response. So we're committed to that. So how are we doing in the city with respect to economic viability? The city has advised us through their, uh, through their publications, the issuance of building permits. We're seeing a rather nice distribution in those building permits, residential and commercial, geographical spread. We're doing a great job through economic development and getting the message out about Hamilton. We have seen commercial industries coming in. We have building going on downtown. McMaster's being built as the medical center. 
Uh, we have the Staybridge suites that were just completed. We've had uh, James Street revitalization. We, we now have Art Crawl, Super Crawl, all of those events that bring economic viability into our city. Super Crawl, uh, the event that takes place in the fall. Uh, last year in policing, the Hamilton Police Service spent $50,000 to police that weekend. And at the end of the weekend, what happened? Nothing. Everything was fine. We want our people to feel safe. We want them to be safe. We want them to come downtown. We want them to go to the art crawl. We want them to go to super crawl. We want them to go to the restaurant. And we don't want it to be a police event. But if something happens, we need to be there. And if something happens and we're not there, I know the questions that you're all going to ask me is why weren't we there and why didn't we do? So we need to plan for these things. Traffic remains the high priority that it is and always will be. Every community meeting that we attend, people tell us about their stop signs, their neighborhood, their speeding, their issues. Heavy here, the two meetings that we had. Speeding, more, more speeding, more visibility, more heavy truck enforcement, get into the, keep the ATVs out of our fields and stop destroying our crops. And we're gonna do that. Traffic is a major issue. In 2003, there were 11,800 collisions in our city. In 2012, was the lowest number of collisions that we have seen in our history at 8,800. That's 3,000 less collisions. That's 3,000 people that didn't crash. That's 3,000 people that didn't get injured. 3,000 people that didn't go to the hospital, didn't have insurance claims. The Allstate Safe Driving Survey that took place uh, over the last four years. Uh, two years ago, we were 31st out of 50. We've moved up to 28. And I know people think, well, that's a big deal. You moved up three spots. That's a huge deal, huge, that's a huge issue because nobody else on the list has moved up three spots that I'm aware of. And what that means is that hopefully we'll see some reductions in our insurance and our insurance uh, claims from all the collisions and things that take place. But the responsibility of the Hamilton Police Service is over the last four years, we've moved our enforcement in our ticket issuance from 42,000 to over 74,000, a 52% increase in our enforcement and a 3,000 reduction in collisions. But we're not wholly responsible for this. We work with the city, we work with roads and traffic, we work with the city road and traffic safety strategy. We have the red light camera uh, installations that get moved around the city periodically. There's a lot of reasons for it. But I will tell you that the most significant reason is the enforcement of our frontline officers. Because I've looked at accident collision stats and enforcement probably for the last 10 or 15 years. And I can show you that when enforcement goes up, collisions go down. There is a positive inverse correlation. So we're doing a, a lot of work. What we need to do is we need to have people stop speeding. We need to have them stop going through stop signs. We need to have them stop drinking and driving. But if they don't, the Hamilton Police Service are going to be there to do our job. So that brings us to the most important part of the evening, and that is the opportunity to answer questions and to listen. Some people may just have a comment that they want to make. Some people may have a question. So I'll open the floor up to any, anyone who wants to uh, ask a question or deliver a comment. Yes? Chief DeCare, I'd first like to thank you uh, for taking the opportunity um, to bring your officers out here to our community and provide us the opportunity to have input into and hear, hear our concerns. Um, I do have one question, and has there been any risk analysis done um, should this budget request not be approved? Um, we are in a position where we have absorbed as much as the Hamilton Police Service can absorb. Um, we have, right now, we have about 100 frauds that have been reported to us that we don't have investigators to assign to them, so they're going to wait. Uh, right now, we have uh, other investigations where you prioritize what we need to do. Uh, things are going to have to wait. So there's risk in that. And the issue for us is we cannot continue to provide all the services that we provide if our funding is not increased to the level that we require. And we're going to have to make reductions. Um, where the service has done more with less for a great number of years, we're going to have to do less with less. But we are committed to provide the highest level of service that we can within the, within the dollars that we are allotted. And that's up to the board and that's up to the city. 
uh, but we are committed to provide public safety at the level that we can within the funds. We don't want to reduce our, pro our, our programs, and I'll tell you why. We're the same people that have argued for those programs over the last period of 5, 10, 20 years to put those in place, the Coast Program. Uh, the po Coast Program is a, prevention, it's a program that other cities are modeling, and we support it, 100% we support it, but we're not going to be able to continue it if we don't have that funding. But before we make those decisions, what we're going to do as a service is if we get to that stage, we're going to convene, we're going to caucus back together, and we're going to try and find the best way to do this. But we are actually going to have to reduce services if we don't receive the funding that we require. That's the risk. Sir? Yeah, I appreciate your speech. It's very good and very supportive of the police. But I'm here as a taxpayer, an overtaxed taxpayer in this ward. And so I'm looking at the context of the whole budget of the city and trying to navigate through the city's financial uh, email records. And that. It's interesting, but you, know, you see the, the deficit in infrastructure. They talk about $2 billion, the accumulated debt. And as a taxpayer, it's a big issue. I would think that initially the response would be, why is any department getting an increase? Why aren't people being asked to cut? I know that's very general, generalized. And then I was reading the, um, I guess, a visionary plan for the city for 2012, 2015. And one of the big issues was continuous improvement. And, and you really approached that subject very nicely today. But in the context of continuous improvement, from my own experience, you gain efficiencies, you get rid of redundancies, you do sharing, with the aim generally to reduce cost, reduce staffing, and I'm just having a hard time rationalizing continuous improvement with a budget increase. And I guess my last point would be, you know, as part of your talk, but your, your initial request for budget has been reduced. What service was reduced to accommodate that reduction? Uh, I'll answer that point first. The 5.25 to 4.75, uh, as the budget process marched along through time, uh, we have to give the Ontario Police College notice that we require X number of positions for the purpose of training. We came in requesting 20 officers. Uh, keeping in mind that the complement of officers that retired last year was 43. They were replaced at different times, but our need for, to plan for training means that we have to, to request the uh, positions for the Ontario Police College. But as time marched along through the budget process, we're actually missing dates for when we could get officers into the service. So what their, what, where their funds would be required for the entire year, because we missed the dates, because our budget process moved along, we actually moved their hiring dates down. So you don't need to budget for their entire salary for the whole year, and we, and we pushed as many as we could. And we actually pushed as many as we could to September, recognizing that within our service, that then represents a risk to us. Calls for service in, the, in, in our city uh, escalate through the summer, June, July, August, September, obviously being the busiest time, the, uh, the nicest weather also a period of uh, high, high vacation leave for our members. It creates a, a real challenge. So what we were trying to do is get those officers in and trained and on the road before the summer, but we're not able to do that through training. So that change coming just in the adjustment 5.25 to 4.75 was a slide of those officers down the year because you don't have to budget for their entire salary. The issue of providing continuous improvement is a commitment, and it's a philosophical commitment. It's something that we strive for, it's something that the city uh, obviously strives for. Um, I never want to put in place a goal within the service to strive for mediocrity. We want, to, we want to strive for excellence. So we want to push, but your points are well taken. It has to, it has to be through business process re-engineering. Sometimes it has to be through technology. It can't always be through people. But the issue that's really challenging us, uh, particularly uh, now, and in all budgets, uh, is what happens within the collective agreements of the service. There's actually three entities that make up policing in this city. 
There's the police services board who have a responsibility in law to provide public safety. That's their responsibility in law. They have negotiating ability with the Hamilton Police Association and the Senior Officers Association. So the associations negotiate, the unions negotiate with the board. They negotiate. The Hamilton Police Service is below the line and out of that negotiation. We advise the board on what policing issues are confronting the challenges of the board that they will consider in their negotiation, but they do the, they do the negotiation. The budget pressure in this year's budget is 3.62 out of those collective agreement negotiations that took place three years ago. So when we get a request to come in at zero, I can't come in at zero because we already have collective agreement pressures at 3.62. So before we even start, I'm at 3.62. That's before we need to buy a car, purchase a gun, do a program, anything, uh, enhance IT, that's it. So we have to start from there. And that's why the pressures that, that we are under. And actually, to, for us to come in at the, the 4.75, when you consider also in, in the city what is growth assessment that is offered in other cities, one percent, one and a half percent, that's not that's not calculated in, in the Hamilton Police Service budget. So we do have a lot of challenges. We are going to strive for excellence. These programs that we're running, case uh, case prep unit, uh, crime analysis, enterprise resource manager, they're all meant to avoid having to hire more people because the labor is extremely expensive. Eighty-eight percent of our budget is the human resource, it's the people. The 12%, not a lot there, not a lot there. Well, at least you don't have to please her and check this out. Uh, yes? Um, yes, I have two questions about um, initiatives that you got to to care. I guess the first is about court staffing. Is there any plan in effect to have a senior officer outside the courts of justice courtrooms to ensure that police officers show up when they're required, organize witnesses, show witnesses statements, review those statements with witnesses, and go into court and testify effectively? That's the first question. Do you want to give second question or do you want to answer? How about one by one? Okay. Uh, we, we do not have a plan in place now to uh, to put any senior officer. Now, I, I just want to be clear on what, what you're asking me. Uh, by the term senior officer in our organization, we mean an inspector or a superintendent. Uh, or, or are you just referring to an experienced police officer? No, I'm referring to someone who could initiate disciplinary proceedings if there's a problem. A staff sergeant could do it. A staff sergeant or a sergeant can initiate disciplinary proceedings, but generally, we would leave that responsibility to an officer in charge of a particular case. They are the ones familiar with the evidence, they're familiar with the uh, witnesses, they're familiar with the victim, they're familiar with our police officers, and our officers, it, it is quite clear, they're to go to court, they're to go to court prepared, prepared in reading their notes, being prepared to answer the questions of the lawyers. Uh, if there is any type of disciplinary action that needs to flow from that, my expectation would be that the officer in charge, a detective or a, or a detective sergeant, would initiate that process. Um, I'm not aware of, of anything coming out of the courts where that needs to be done, but the procedures are already in place for that to be done. Yeah, as, as a former assistant crown attorney, when I'm doing an impaired case, the officer says, well, I left the card with the breath demand on it back at the station. I'm not going to go to court branch and say, look, this officer screwed up on something basic. I'm just going to say, I'm not going to trust that officer again. And when I started this job back in 79, there was a court officer right in court in St. Catharines. And when there were problems, they were dealt with immediately and they were treated seriously. Yeah, that doesn't have to be dealt with. It does need to be dealt with from the, the, in terms of, of the action that took place. But it doesn't need to be dealt with by a person on site and, and staff. That Again, that's an investment in human resources that need to be there. You can follow that up through the court office. You can follow that up through our office. You can advance a, uh, an email to the divisional commander. We'll be happy to take that on and, and deputy it. So yeah, and Andy, you know we have the uh, police crowd liaison, and certainly we'd like to have that feedback from them. And, and uh, obviously, yeah, I know it's an issue for you. We haven't heard that. 
uh, come up through the, the police crown liaison, but certainly I'm hearing it today. Certainly something we're going to put on the agenda. Uh, it may be uh, us, uh, I mean, we're talking about additional staff, and, and obviously I, I don't know if that, I understand your issues. I think we can do it through policy and maybe some follow-up, and, and, and certainly having that better liaison with the project. But in pursuit of excellence, you have to see the end product. You have to see the officer in the stand. You have to see those cases result convictions. And there just isn't a police presence there that I, I think is adequate. But again, it's a staffing issue. And I really do appreciate how squeezed you are. And believe me, when you mention the charter and the costs imposed by that statute, uh, you have my complete sympathy. Thank you. Well, one of the issues, of course, historically is uh, there was a time when, when we had uh, supervisors in every court. Yes. And, and physically there to, to help with the Crown packages, to help with the assistant Crown, to help get the process moving, yes. to make sure prisoners showed up at the right time, all of that. Uh, but again, that's uh, that's a, a real expensive administrative process. Yes, I, I can understand that. The second uh, issue is the case preparation unit. Is is it? My understanding is it relates to uniform investigations only. And there are four staff sergeants involved, and one civilian employee. More civilian employees. Yeah, go ahead and I'll give you the staff. So far, so good. <laughs> We have one staff sergeant that oversees it. Yes. We have four supervisors, and then we have a constable. We have a total of 14. We recognize that we can only provide that service at this point to the uh, frontline officers, and we're starting to branch out as we get better at the process. Our original business <coughs> case was to request 18 officers in that and do it service-wide, which includes our investigative services people, and have them be able to do it. They need to spend more time investigating and less time doing paperwork. So what we want to do is we want to grow that unit to maximize the return on investment of the unit and get the hours off of all the investigators. That's the goal. Okay. Before that, staff sergeants were expected to review Crown briefs and ensure the investigation was done correctly and all the material was necessary for it. So why, if staff sergeants were doing their job, why did this new unit have to be created? Uh, that's, that's an excellent question because it still required police officers to come in, sit down in front of the uh, computer, and prepare all that paperwork. As I mentioned, on average, four hours and 17 per, per package. You know all the paperwork that's got to go into it. Yes. They've got to complete all that. And then they would electronically forward it within the system for supervisory approval. That's the part the staff sergeants would do. Keeping in mind that that staff sergeant is running a squad of 25 officers doing all those calls for service out in their area. And what we said to them, oh, and by the way, while you're looking after all those calls and all those officers out there, do this process here as well and make sure you approve all that paperwork. And our old process was, oh, and while you're doing that as well, here we got an internal investigation for you to do as well. We overloaded them to the point where, where it was dysfunctional. And what we need to do is we need to fix that. The scope of work that can be done by one individual in supervising 25 officers, all the calls for service, all the priority response issues, and then load them up with a whole bunch of paperwork as well. That's why we've taken, through professional standards now, we've taken the internal investigations away through the, uh, through the uh, centralized case prep unit now. We've transferred that paperwork, and the supervisors in case prep do the same task that the staff sergeant did. The staff sergeant now, run the road. Make sure all the officers are out there doing their work, doing the calls for service, make sure all that policy and procedure manual, which is that thick, there's 197 procedures and policies on it. Right. It's, do it's it. Too there's, there's too much there. It, it, there's, there is too much, and that's why we're trying to streamline these processes. The burden that we put on our staff sergeant said, but by the way, yeah, don't mess up anything, too. It's, it's not responsible. Well, when I spoke to staff sergeants a number of years ago, they said they didn't read the files, which explained why there were so many errors and omissions in preparation. And what I don't understand is, when you increase the distance between the supervisor and the working officer, okay, you reduce accountability, you reduce the ability to monitor the work the man is doing or the woman is doing. If there's a problem with an investigation, it's the, staff, it's the supervisor who is close to the officer who is in the best position to solve the problem. With this arrangement here, physically, you've divorced the supervisor from the person who's being supervised. 
the mountain stuff stays at the mountain where the CPU is, right? Central has to go to the mountain. East end has to go to the mountain. There's a time delay there and a distance delay there, and you lose the face-to-face -face thing where you have a supervisor telling a police officer, you didn't do this job right. So it seems to me that the issue is to get the staff sergeant back involved in investigations. Investigators can't investigate until they know how to put the whole case together. So isn't something been lost there? Is this unit really necessary if staff sergeants workloads are adjusted so they actually can read briefs and can ensure that things are investigated properly. I understand the concept and I, I agree with the principles, but that's not how it actually takes place on a day-to-day -day basis. So if I'm working in Central and I electronically ship my case up to case prep and they prepare it and there's something wrong, through the electronic, uh, through the electronic process, through the records management system, there's a task that goes back to my, my immediate supervisor that says you need to get this to the officer and fix this. That's where that direct supervision piece takes place. They're doing the paperwork component. The supervisory responsibility still remains with the division. It still remains for the constables. It still remains with the sergeant and the staff sergeant on that squad looking after those issues. There is direct accountability built into the process. But not face to face. Uh, no, I disagree. Uh, the case prep unit identifies a problem, ships it back to their supervisor, and then they deal with it. Uh, I would agree with you uh, on, on one issue. Through the electronic mechanism, I as a supervisor can send it to my officer and have them, and have them correct it. That's true. But if I, if I want to sit down with the officer, if I recognize a problem and I want to sit down with them and go through it, I can do that too. So you have that direct supervisory accountability. How is the effectiveness of this um, unit being assessed? Um, Inspector Weatherall is doing performance measurement metrics, time, time that we're saving, time on the, uh, uh, and we're doing it in a couple of ways. We want to do it through the submissions of the officers. So we've done surveys with them, how much time are you spending on this, what are you doing on that, what crown package, that's one part of it. In order to take the natural human bias out of it as well, through our IT department, we did it electronically behind the scenes. Log on time, uh, time accessing that case, time accessing that case occurrence, time preparing this report, and then adding all of those up together. So we had both a human intervention and we had a... That's all technique. quantitative, that's not qualitative. If you want the qualitative assessment, you really have to speak to the case management coordinators in the Crown's office, who are the end unit, who are the end users. What I'm saying is you can generate all the numbers that you want, but the numbers won't tell you if the investigations are being done thoroughly and effectively. Right. And that's why we have, as the deputy mentioned, we have the Crown, Crown Liaison Committee that come together, and that's where all those problems that surface up into Tim Powers' office come forward to the police service, we sit down at the table and discuss those, and then decide what we need to do about those qualitative issues. We're trying. We're trying to to produce that. Thank you. Uh, can I go to another speaker before you? Sure. Uh, first, the uh, first principles. Of course, if nobody wants to put his hand. No. I'd like to make more of a comment than a criticism. Uh, my name is Kevin Ells. I've lived in Edmonton my entire life. Uh, worked here for 28 years. The company I worked for went out of business and I was relocated to Cambridge, Ontario with my employment. Uh, I chose not to relocate to Cambridge. I commute every day. One of those reasons is that feeling of security within this city. Uh, the confidence I have within our own police force, uh, within the way our city operates, it's all of its services. Um, what I'm really trying to say here is that, uh, as my fellow neighbor indicated, we do feel overtaxed, but I believe, Mr. Whitehead, that there are other places to cut budgets and there's other places to look to reduce funds, and it shouldn't be in police services. It shouldn't be in the protection of our, of our neighbors and of other citizens, and it shouldn't be at the potential of jeopardy for our fellow officers that are out there because they're understaffed. I mean, all you have to do is look at those uh, stats when you compare our city to the other cities across Ontario, indicating that we are one of the lowest staff per 100,000. Uh, citizens. It's just it's just really not where we need to be looking to save money. I'm sure there's other places that it can be done and just as a taxpayer that's paid taxes in this city uh, my entire life, at least my working life, uh, my hat's off to the uh, members of the police force in this uh, hall tonight and all those that serve this city. You've done a fantastic job 
And uh, I feel very safe in this city because of these, uh, you know, uniformed officers. And I thank you for your service. go to the back row, uh, I'd like to also, I did the introductions at the beginning, but uh, Maria Pearson joins, joins us as one of our city council uh, representatives here. Thank you. Sir? And, and to continue on that note, I, I'm a principal of a secondary school here in this community, and, and I'm here with uh, the vice principal of the school. Uh, I've been in education for uh, the last 27 years, and uh, 12 years of that uh, as an administrator at a school at uh, three different high schools where I've had the opportunity to work very closely with our police uh, school liaison officers and, and for those of you that might not know they are assigned to uh, different schools within the area and, and I've been privileged to work with them uh, certainly over those last 12 years and I just want to I'm here to speak uh, on their behalf and to give you an idea of what sort of they do within not just within the school, but also within our community and, and uh, the neighborhood that uh, uh, we are at. Uh, our, our present student population at our school is uh, 1,550 students, and, and certainly uh, all of those students deserve to be in, in an inclusive and certainly in, in a safe environment. And you need to know that our, our school days officer is, is instrumental in creating certainly that safe environment within our school. And one of the reasons for that, they are part of the 40% that was mentioned earlier. They do the role of uh, very, they're very proactive in their role uh, rather than being reactive. They're involved in a number of proactive activities in the school and they're also involved in a, a number of programs that uh, they've been trained to, whether that is programs on drugs, uh, whether that is programs on, on uh, gang violence, uh, the ever-increasing uh, problems with cyberbullying. Uh, they have been trained in those areas, and they end up presenting to our students in classes. They end up presenting in big school assemblies, and also they present to our, our teachers within the school and uh, to our, our parents' community. Um, they frequently visit our schools, even though they're assigned to so many schools, and I can't express to you the importance of them being there physically just to see seeing them there visibly is so, it's so important, not just to our students, but also to our local communities. In the school we're at, we have a number of businesses within the area, and just even knowing that uh, uh, their involvement, uh, that this is a commitment that involves not just them, but it involves our school community and the community that's surrounding. Uh, they conduct drug sweeps outside of the school, and certainly um, we do not tolerate any uh, you know, students uh, in possession uh, or use of drugs. They, they meet with parents one-to-one -one regarding some, sometimes very difficult uh, situations that uh, parents have run of the <coughs> on how to deal with their own children and they try to work with the schools and in working in conjunction with our school liaison officer certainly once again they are trained in many intervention strategies that help support these parents and those students uh, we certainly know all the media attention that bullying has been getting a, a sort of across the country and they are trained in these intervention strategies uh, they are certainly trained in many areas of conflict resolution and restorative justice practices and many times they come into our restorative justice circles where we have groups where there's conflict going on and we sit down with these students in a circle where they basically have an opportunity to discuss some of the problems that existed, uh, who they hurt in certain situations, and what can they do to make it right. Um, as a school administrator for 12 years, I, I gotta tell you, I can't imagine not being at a school uh, without having the support of a, a a school liaison officer and so I'm basically here uh, on their behalf uh, I can't imagine trying to uh, call the station uh, we didn't have uh, them to intervene in certain situation where basically a lot of the responses would all be reactionary and uh, really their, their role is proactive we appreciate everything they do and so sir on behalf of myself and the vice principal that's here and I know that I'm also speaking to many of the other elementary and secondary uh, principals that are in this community so once again I want to thank you for the work that you do for uh, our, certainly our community I just want to touch back on one of your slides um, regarding about uh, parades and special events. 
Um, I noticed there wasn't actually a cost line in there on your budget, but through uh, personal knowledge, uh, the budget uh, is presented each year for to police, parades, special events, road closures, and anything that does not have a cost factor to the public that's incorporated in your budget. Now you mentioned about how the police spent $50,000 on the super call, and I would assume that came out of the police budget. It wasn't actually a cost factor. Directly impacted the community. Uh, my question to you is, um, it's happening in my area, and we're looking at possibly have to reallocate the funds because our budget's been taxed to the burden. And if the city is asking for a 0%, you have to come up with some efficiency somewhere. And this way you can now start saying to people at Super Bowl, you might have to say, uh, we gave you $50,000 with the police free last year. However, we have to find some sort of form to recoup our costs. So is the police looking at any way, shape, or form of going that route, or are you going to try to stay flatlined and not having that? But I would assume that your budget per year has increased dramatically. Uh, we have... Uh, we have had an opportunity to look at some of the surrounding jurisdictions that are utilizing a consumption of consumption of resource fee model fire service. Um, if the fire service sometimes has to other jurisdictions, if they have to respond to a car accident, you get charged for a rig and you get charged for a crew and you get charged for what, whatever that is. Uh, we haven't done that in policing. Uh, where we try to uh, have a saw off, particularly with our community events, is there's usually a combination of, uh, of policing provided, which is referred to as specials or pay duty officers that are hired uh, to look after different issues. Uh, you know, festival gets uh, liquor permits and they are going to have liquor, well, they'll hire pay duty officers to deal with that. Uh, we have Hess Village where it is a, it is a joint uh, structure in place between the uh, between the, the, the owners, uh, uh, the bars, and what they pay in relation to having the extra policing services that are required there. I can tell you that what they consume and what they pay, uh, and then what we have to add in addition, those things don't add up because they actually consume a much greater amount of our policing resources in that area, the entertainment district, than, than is actually paid for. Um, continuing with uh, with that thought, uh, there's uh, different models for that. We're trying to get uh, in place processes where police officers, expensive police officers, are pulled out of those details. I'll give you an example. Uh, we had a we had a very significant fire on King Street just before Christmas. Uh, our officers are required to be there for the purpose of the investigation, whether it be criminal, fire marshal. We have an obligation in law to be there to participate in that investigation. And what we did was we partnered with the city and, and we brought the city vehicles over, uh, city signage over, and city fencing over, and we just blocked that whole thing and we can take our police officers right off the traffic direction so we don't have to be there. We must maintain the scene for the purpose of the investigation, but all the subsidiary roads around that that needed to be blocked, that doesn't have to be done by the police. Our authority is there in the initial instance to shut down all the roads, but once we work with our city partners, there's other strategies to take the burden off the police, very expensive. Put a sign up there, the flashing sign, road closed. That is a in-law uh, uh, legal road closure. So we have to obey that. So we're looking for those strategies. But we're, we have not gone down the path of charging anybody for our actual services that are, that are consumed. The other component of that that I would have to look very seriously at is particularly around the issue of uh, violence, uh, sexual assault, child abuse, all those things. Uh, I'd be very leery of any type of fee schedule, if you will. Uh, we want to make sure that people feel encouraged to come to the police and never have the concept of, of finances in their mind that would prevent them from accessing law enforcement services. So we gotta be very careful it's, uh, with that, but it's a good concept, I thank you for the idea. Chief, just want to follow up on that because uh, I know the slide you're talking about, there was like 32 uh, community events, or should I say protests. And what we've seen in the last couple of years, I mean, there's the parades which we charge special duties, but what we've seen is it's been a trend right across North America for civil disobedience. 
And, and basically, anyone that has a, an issue, or they're, they're, they're gathering together using social networks or whatever to, to come out and protest. And what happens <coughs> is they might gather at Gage Park or City Hall, but then they take to the streets. And so it's our responsibility to police those. And they sometimes are, are five minutes, ten minutes, but there's always an operational plan that puts in place. There always has to be an incident commander that's in there. But we've also seen them that they're repeated. We had uh, um, a group that was uh, just about every uh, every Monday or Tuesday night they, they protested in, in the city of Hamilton. And so it was a regular group uh, with their, their pots and pans and they would protest. But they would take over the street and that would of course, uh, consume quite a bit of police resources. So those, when the chief shows you those 33, those are actually specific on civil disobedience things where we would actually have respond as, as an operational part. And I would love to be able to charge them back for the work that they have. Yes, right at the back. Uh, refresh my memory, did you say uh, on, in the press at any time an approximate tax increase per household based upon your 4.75 increase? Um, the uh, work that we did previously and presented to the board, uh, 4.75% increase based on uh, a Hamilton population through the Ontario Municipal Board and the uh, housing uh, stats from them as well. 4.75, about $12.13, uh, uh, and $30 per household. Uh, but we also use the city's numbers uh, uh, on uh, population at 519,000 and 214,000, and it's uh, $12.30 and $30 per person and then per household. So $12.30. $12 but the 30 is per household? Per household. Um, so with that increase per household, what level of service increase would I see in Ward 11? What level of service increase? Uh, we are going to be able to continue all of the programs that are in place now. We are going to be, we would be able to continue with our infrastructure programs in relation to uh, time and resource management, more strategic deployment, advance the case prep unit, Make sure our officers are getting out there at a, at a greater uh, level to be in the neighborhoods. As I mentioned with case prep, we're re we've removed three hours administrative time from the uh, from the EDP uh, Emotional Crisis uh, St. Joe's protocol. We're reducing time there. That's all time that's got to get back into the uh, back into the uh, uh, back into the community. So the level of service that you're going to see, I believe, will be a reduction in response times a greater opportunity for the service to maintain our 60-40 deployment model and keep the officers in those neighborhoods. We've heard very clearly from the community, uh, particularly out here, be visible in the community, have the wheels rolling, because what we can't tell you is the, we're, looking, we're always looking for measurement matrix, performance measures, what we can't tell you is how much crime we prevented by, by proactive patrol. I can't tell a police officer, you drove by the bank and the robber who was watching the bank didn't rob the bank. I can't tell police officers that. But I can tell you, and I was looking at a study this morning from uh, Philadelphia, the presence of police officers, the presence of foot patrol and visible police officers. That's why our action officers are on foot or on bike. They are not allowed to be in a car. What do police officers do in a car? They drive up and down the street. We don't want that. We want visible officers 40 officers that we move all over the city when we need, depending on the crime. Uh, and they've been out, Landbrook, Brimbrook, they've been out here. Uh, there are a few arrests that just got made in relation to some cars that were getting tipped over and some mischiefs that, that were taking place out here. Those arrests have been made. Five individuals identified, three arrested. Uh, we want to be able to do that to address the quality of life and the public disorder issues that are in the community. We have three officers uh, from County line to Parkdale, is that still the case? Yes, it is. So we're not likely to see three a designated patrol officers, plus I have spare officers that patrol in the area as well. So the, the number, the hard number is three, the actual number is probably closer to five. But we're not likely to see an actual additional officer. We're just, you're anticipating that when there's a need, one of those officers may not get called. 
to another location yeah. or something for, like that? For the East End in the budget request, there are five officers that are coming, five uniform officers coming to the East End station, five officers going up to the mountain. Uh, what we're also looking at is in the city's busiest patrol areas, the busiest beats, is we don't want to go back and redesign beats and do all of that costs a ton of money to rejig the entire city and the systems are already built. What we want to do is we're going to, we're going to consider the concept of zone cars within those beat areas, within the zone, to make sure we supplement the officers. Uh, we will have officers that are working a particular beat that are busy, but they're not overly busy. We have other beats where officers come in, they clear, they get a call, they clear, they get a call, they clear, they get a call, all day long, go, 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 go. We gotta get them some help because we gotta be able to get all that work done in those areas. Uh, I've had discussions with some of the councilors. You know, in my area, I haven't seen a population increase and, and I don't need additional police officers. You're right, and you're not gonna get them because the crime analysis is not there. Just driving around and being available to respond, we can't do that. We just cannot do that. It's horrendously expensive. Because what that would mean is if Paul and I are working in the in, in adjoining areas, I would be extremely busy. He'd be sitting idle. He would want to come over and help me with the calls that I'm doing, but the geographical uh, uh, distribution of officers would not allow for that. He stays in the anticipation of calls. That's not maximizing our resources. We need to get all the effort out of all of our officers all the time. So it's going to be to say to you that you're going to get a new patrol officer in that area. I can't say that to you. I cannot. You said 36 new officers, and then you started to say uh, four here, four there, and so on. So that total is the 36 new officers at the 4.75? No, 20 officers. And well, the earlier on the presentation, you said 36 more officers. When you were talking about oh no, I'm sorry that that's the staffing plan that's the big visionary piece that we want to get to eventually but we have to let all these programs uh, uh, take place it's 61 it's 45 officers and 16 civilians you got me but if you want to move it from 20 to 36 I'm with you. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. um, the, uh, and you said you had, I think one of the charts showed 797 um, officers. Yes. So I didn't hear any conversation about attrition or retirement. Okay. Um, uh, we had 43 members uh, leave the service last year. Uh, one of the highest levels of retirements that we have seen. But built within the base budget, those officers are already replaced. Those officers are already replaced. Right now, about 50% uh, of our service has 10 years or less. So the learning continues always for our police officers. So, I mean, we take those of us that have been around for a long time, we take for granted what you've learned and it's just a part of history. Well, these people haven't lived that history, so we need to transfer that history to them through succession planning, through mentoring, through coaching, to get them up to speed to provide that same level of service. So we have, we have those programs in place to, to get our officers, keep their certifications up to the level. Uh, there are 82 officers in the service this year that are eligible for retirement. We generally see about 20 to 25%. Uh, so we'll be, you know, the 15, 18 uh, area. But, but our challenge really is also is some officers that are going to retire, they hold that very close to their chest and they don't let anybody know until the last possible minute. But we have to be able to provide for that. That's why we work with our board on pre-approvals of hires. We do not use the concept of gapping dollars. Gapping dollars, a member uh, retires in, uh, in January. So we don't hire, don't hire, don't hire, don't hire, and we replace them in December and you've got salary savings. We can't do that because you've got 80,000 calls for service that need to be responded to. I've got 300,000 events that need to be done. They've got to be done. So we can't allow the passage of time, so we do not gap uh, in an effort to have uh, savings. We have to provide the service, because when the phone rings, you got to go. So we, have a, we do have a retirement and succession plan in place. Thank you, excellent questions. Uh, yes? Yeah. 
By the way, I do support this gentleman here regarding uh, budget savings should come from other departments. I just want to comment on the courts. This is what the gentleman was talking about. And my uh, mother-in-law, about six years ago, was almost killed in a hit and run. And uh, the police did a tremendous job between the investigative officer and the actual reconstruction unit, I think it's called. And for about 14 months, once a month, I went to court to see if the accused was going to show up. Never showed up for the lawyers there. But you see all these officers sitting there. Is there any preliminary dialogue, dialogue that can take place between the officers and the defense attorney? Or I feel bad for these guys sitting there and their their cases don't come up. Their yeah. accused isn't there. This is a historic issue for us. Uh, and I, as much as we engage in dialogue with uh, with the very learned defense counsel, until uh, the day of the appearance in front of the judge with everybody there, all of the witnesses, and the defense lawyer sees the whites of the eyes of everybody, uh, they're not going to make any sort of commitment at all because if one of those witnesses doesn't show up and I've got an opportunity to, to uh, step forward and say, we're ready to proceed, where's your witness? Oh, they're busy, tied up, gone. Um, sorry. Uh, those are games that are played within the legal system every single day. Um, and have we tried to get together to have discussions? You know, here's a list of 10, uh, 10 witnesses. Who do you need? Do you need that one? Do you need that one? Are you arguing this? Are you arguing that? We still have those discussions and try to frame that down to something manageable. But at the end of the day, right at the last minute in the courtroom, that is up to the defense counsel on how they're going to strategize. And let's face it, they're not worried about the police service budget. They're not worried about the court budget. They're worried about representing the concerns of their client. Um, I, what time is it? Well, it's 8.30. Um, we'll take one last question. Sure. Um, going back to the police versus civilian ratio, the, the departments that demonstrate a higher number of officers, do those departments also demonstrate lower number of crimes? Um, not necessarily. Every jurisdiction is different. Um, let me give you a flavor for what that actually is. So, with respect to all of the Ontario Municipal data that has been presented, the ratio of one police officer to citizens. So we have one police officer that is responsible for 666 citizens. We are the sixth largest city in the province of Ontario. We are sixth in our representation of officers to 666 persons. We have uh, our ratio, 153. We are eighth of the 14 agencies. So we are eighth, but we're the sixth largest city. Our crime, violent crime index is second highest in the province. Our crimes against property is fifth highest in the province. Our violent crime index is third highest in the province. Our crime severity index is sixth, and our total crime severity is, is, uh, is fifth. What I can tell you is that there are other jurisdictions with lower levels of police officers per 100,000. But I can also tell you that all of those jurisdictions have a lower crime severity rate than Hamilton. So we got a ton of work to do. Sir? Just make one last comment, Chief. Uh, my name is Roy Ellis, lived in the city my whole life as well. Um, I like to, I agree with everything that my brother had said earlier. Uh, one of the things that you mentioned about the officers being in the neighborhoods, you know, back on the beat, policing, <coughs> Uh, reminds me of the day when I was a kid. We grew up in the north end of Hamilton. Uh, it was a rough and tough neighborhood. Um, you know, you took your licks and you moved on. But the, the police officers on the street that, you know, that we grew up with and all that, they knew us, we knew them. Um, they knew if there was a problem, they knew who to go to talk to or, or who the kids were that they, you know, they could count on. And it was very, very good. What the principal here said about the policing in the schools, uh, the liaison officers, that's 
an incredible thing. It's the right thing to do. It's the right place to be. We do not need any of the incidences that we've had in the U.S. that you know we're all familiar with what that was about. Um, so kudos to you guys for doing that. The other thing was that you mentioned that the original budget, I think, was 5.25%. Um, you whittled it back to 47 But then you made the comment that you're coming in at 3.6%, right? With That's your, your bottom level. You can't get below that because you're already committed in funds and everything? No, that, no. Uh, uh, the 3.62 is the collective bargaining agreement pressure. Uh, at no time did I say I'm coming in at 3.62. No, no, but is that included <laughs> in your budget? That, ha that is yeah. included in the 4.75. Yes. Right. Yeah, that's yes. what I'm getting at. Okay. So in actuality, you're not at 4.7, you're at about uh, 1.2 increase at $30 a household, you're saying. And, and that increase to a household, the 30 bucks is just based on the policing or? That's it? just the policing component. That's all my, oops, I'm sorry, I got my 30 bucks in my pocket right now for you. <laughs> I, I think it's money well spent. <laughs> Be uh, very respectful of your time because you have you have interrupted your schedule to participate in what is for us a very important meeting. While we've enjoyed the safety and security of, of, of this event, uh, please remember that 1,200 of our officers and our civilian members are out there every single day delivering their professional best, and they will continue to do so. And we're absolutely committed to public safety. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you.